Israelites were in Egypt for close to 430 years. When Jacob and his sons went to Egypt because of the famine in Canaan, for nearly 430 years they were in the uh, Egypt. And uh, several pharaohs changed and now there came a pharaoh who didn't know anything about uh, Joseph. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 1, there was a pharaoh who came who didn't know anything about Joseph. What Joseph did to that country is remarkable. He rescued the country from a severe famine. God gave him wisdom. God's spirit was in him. He uh, helped this country get over the world's uh, severest drought, the biggest famine. And the people were so happy, he was made second rank to the king. Time passed by, people forgot uh, Joseph. So Joseph's people, that is Jacob and his brothers and their children, totaled 70 people, 7-0, they came to the land of Egypt to find shelter, to find some food. They were immigrants. So when they were there, after some time, there came a situation, the Pharaoh changed. And when the Pharaoh changed, he didn't care about these people. Now, these people had become, thank you, these people had become a liability. These people, as they were growing in number, the Pharaoh said, you know, they have one strength. What is that? More in number. They have a people's strength. And when there are more people, you can plan to do anything. For example, when the people are there and then in their unity, I'll tell you one thing, mark these words, even God is alarmed by the unity among the people. When it is especially intended for wrong purposes. Genesis chapter 11 tells about the story of Tower of Babel. When these people came together, they spoke the same language. God said something very powerful. Look at this. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And verse 6. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. God told them to go and occupy the rest, the whole earth. These people said, we will gather together and build a big tower. And God said, they have great unity, but that unity is for wrong purpose. And God said, their unity is so powerful, they speak the same language, they have all one mind, therefore, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. So what did God do? He came down and said what? Confuse their languages. He confused their languages and that's how all the languages in the world have come to be. So when there was no communication, what happened was people got scattered. You get it? Pharaoh probably understood that. These people are all one people and if they are more in number, they could be a coup, there could be a problem. So he made them as what? Slaves. There's a very, very dangerous word to use here especially in America isn't it but you know what the Bible says these Hebrews they became slaves the difference between a slave and a servant is this servant has to be paid slave doesn't have to be paid servant can have his rights their labor unions but a slave doesn't have any rights you are bound to me forever I may not feed you, nobody can question me. You have fever, I ask you to do work, you have to do work. I need not be compassionate with you. That is how Israelites were under that slavery for 430 years. And that's when they cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, please help us get out of this slavery. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2 and verse... 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Can you imagine this word? 
I think you know you should underline this word. God looked on Israelites and was concerned about them. You know what I would do? I would change a few words here and apply it to my life. I would say, God looked on Chandra and was concerned about him. Can any of us prove that this is wrong? Change your name and put your name there and say, God looked on, write your name there and say, was concerned, of, concerned about him or her or me. Can any of us prove this wrong? It's the same God yesterday, today and forever. When these people cried out and said, Lord, we are languishing in this slavery. Can you help us? God heard from heaven. He heard their prayer from heaven and did what? Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I am concerned about their suffering. Again repeated here. Look at verse 8. So, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. If it was a human logic, there should be a period after this word. What is that? So, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. What was their prayer? Lord, free us from this problem. Redeem us from this slavery. So what should God say? Okay, I'll redeem you from this problem. God doesn't stop there. You know what he says? And verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites ask you this question did the Israelites ever ask God to take them to the promised land no it was God's promise to Abraham Isaac and Jacob these people totally forgot their prayer was only one-sided what is that help us free us out of this problem and God said hey you know I'll free you but you don't understand one thing and not only will I free you, but I'm also take, going to take you to the promised land. I'm going to take you to the place where there is milk and honey flowing. Wow. Lord, are you going to take me there? Yes. I'm going to take you to the land flowing with milk and honey. In the process, 40 years were done. At the end of 40 years, they come to, we come to the book of Joshua. Moses died. God raised Joshua and said, Joshua, now you have to lead these people. Joshua said, okay, Lord, but I need support from you. God said, you know what? The kind of support that I gave, the kind of you know, assurance, the kind of credibility I gave to Moses, I will give to you too. So what happened was during the time of Moses, they crossed what? They crossed the Red Sea. They came to Jordan in Joshua and they crossed the river Jordan and people started believing that yes, Joshua is the right man. So they came to, we come to Joshua chapter 6 where they defeated the uh, people of Jericho by going around the walls of Jericho. There was conquest after conquest after conquest. But there came a situation. They were supposed to go from Egypt to Canaan and this was a straight route. It took them, should have taken them 11 days, but they, they disobeyed God. So they went down like this. They came down. They stayed here for 38 odd years and then went around and came from the east. They were supposed to go from Egypt to Canaan on the west route because of their disobedience. They came down south and from here they came to the east and that is where Aaron died and then up on another mountain, um, Moses died and then they came from the east side. So, there were 12 tribes of Israel. In these 12 tribes of Israel, two and a half tribes, they were very hasty. They said, we want the land on this side. We have a lot of cattle. See, we have a lot of cattle. So, what do we do? We find a lot of greenery here. So, we want to stay back here. Mind you, they had not yet, yet gone into the promised land. Listen carefully. They had not yet gone into the promised land, but there were some people who were hasty and they calculated their resources 
They calculated their needs. They saw that they had so much of cattle. They also saw a lot of greenery and the pastures. They came to Moses and said, Moses, we would rather stay back here. We want to stay back here. Their calculation was their material needs. I want, to, I want you to understand something. Even in the spiritual journey, people could become materialistic. This journey is a spiritual journey. In, in a sense, it is a spiritual journey. See, when you, when you, when you study uh, Joshua, please remember this. When you study Joshua, also study book of Ephesians. Joshua and Ephesians are two very closely knitted books. The theme in Joshua is the same theme in Ephesians. What do we know in Ephesians? Look at your bulletin. On the top there is one verse. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, what does it mean? Does the Bible say God will bless you? Does the, does the Bible say God will bless you? Look at verse 3, Ephesians 1, 3. If you have the bulletin, look it up on the top. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Bible doesn't say He will bless you. It says, who has blessed us. What is it? Past tense. God has already blessed us. So one big question comes, if God has already blessed me, why am I languishing? Why am I like a pauper? Why am I living a defeated life? When I read this verse, I always remember my father. You know, when I got married, my waist was 28. I was very lanky. You know, you can see my son. You can understand that. Yeah. So that's how I was very thin. My brother was thin, my sister was thin, and uh, every day this is one big problem in my house. At the dinner time, lunch time, wherever the food, whenever the food comes. So he says, my dad would say, eat well, eat well man, eat, see look at the other people, yeah, yeah. look at the other people, see how strong that fellow is, you see how big that boy is, yeah, people will say what? That the people who want to take a dig at your parents, you know what, what do they say? Hey, is your dad not feeding you? Is your mom not feeding you? Why are you so thin? Why are you so thin, isn't it? You know, it's a genetic makeup. You know, people take time to build up their body. It's okay. But the people would say, why are you so thin? There is food in your house. Father says this. There is food in the house. But why are you so thin? Isn't it? Applied to spiritual life. God says, I have already blessed you, but why are you defeated? Why are you living a life of no blessing? It's like, you know, a lady who was given, uh, who got a uh, check from her son. And it's, it was a very big money. And they were poor people. The boy came to uh, America and they earned a lot of money, a lot of money. And one day he sent his money in the form of a check to his mom. His mom used to live in a hut. And uh, she was living a very poor life and uh, she came and told the pastor, Pastor, you know what, I'm so struggling. My son went to US and he is earning a lot of money, I heard, and I never got a single penny from him. And I'm so, so languishing, my son forgot me. So um, she said, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow is my son's birthday. Would you come and pray in my house? So the pastor went to their house, it was a hut. So he had to bend down, he went into that place, stinky place, and uh, he went inside and uh, he uh, looked at one uh, picture frame. He looked at one picture frame and said, what is this? She said, I don't know, This my son sent me, so I love my son, so I made a frame of that and put it on the wall. He said, ma'am, do you know what that is? She says, yeah, but there's no picture on it, there's no face, there's no picture, there's something written on it. And as a token of what my son sent, I just put it on the frame and put it there. He said, ma'am, did you know that there are $100,000 in that check there? That was a check of $100,000 and the mom had done what? 
made a frame, put a frame and put it onto the wall. And she is living a poor life. I heard of another example where there was a beggar begging with a golden ball. You get it? He was begging with what? A golden ball. What should you do with the golden ball? Go sell it, get the money. We call such people are like, they're out of their mind. Applied to spiritual life. God says, I've blessed you. Why are you not living a blessed life? Where's the problem? Is the giving a problem? No, he has already given. He has already given. You have your check with you in your pocket on the wall, on a frame, and you still want to go say, give me. That makes sense. The Lord has blessed us in spiritual places. So therefore, in the book of Ephesians, in the, God, in the epistle to the Ephesians, this is what we study. When the Israelites, in the book of Joshua, when they came to Canaan, please remember this, I want to clarify this. Some people who have heard and have said this, I totally disagree, the Bible disagrees with them, you should be very careful how people interpret the word of God. So, when the Israelites came from Egypt to Canaan, Canaan is not heaven. Okay? Canaan is not heaven. Canaan is not picture of heaven. Canaan is not even a symbol of heaven. Why? Because in heaven there are, in, in Canaan what were there? There were wars. There were battles. There was killing. In heaven, would you have wars? Have you ever seen anywhere in the Bible that in heaven there is a war? There is a battle? No? So what is Canaan? Canaan is a victorious life. Now you may say, Try to understand the book of Joshua. It's a beautiful book. See, we don't get victory over sin overnight. God redeems us from sin. When we go to Lord Jesus Christ and ask Him to forgive our sins, that is when He will forgive us. And how much does, uh, time does it take for God to forgive us? There's a song which says, It happens in a flash. The song says, It happens in a flash. When the Lord says, I have forgiven you, immediately done. We went to, uh, uh, you know, sight and sound. We saw the Jesus story. You know, when Jesus uh, touched this blind man and healed him, did, did it take some time for him to get healed? Yes? Read the Bible. What do you see? Immediately. The man who had leprosy, his leprosy went after five days, ten days? Did it gradually go? No. What happened? Immediately. So, the healing of Lord Jesus Christ was immediate. The salvation that God gives to us is very immediate, right away on the, on the spot. That's when we are all in the race. Okay. Now in this race, what happens in the book of, book of Joshua, God says, there are people, the land I'm going to give you is not an empty land. There are people already living there. You know what you need to do? With my help, you need to go displace those people. There are Canaanites, there are Jebusites, there are Hevites. There are people of different nationalities. You know what you need to do? You need to go and defeat those people. You know what the meaning is? This is the picture of a Christian life where we overcome our sin step by step. One after another. One after another. And that's why in Ephesians, if you study carefully, the parallel between these is what? You know, in, Eph in Joshua it talks about canon. In Ephesians it talks about God has blessed us in uh, heavenly places. Is there a conflict in spiritual life? Yes or no? Is there a conflict in spiritual life? Yes. There is conflict in spiritual life. The, Jesus, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed that prayer. Lord, what? What did he say? My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak, isn't it? When you want to pray, when you want to pray, okay, let's put it this way. Are we all, let's ask, ask this question ourselves, okay? Don't have to judge one another. Let's ask this question ourselves. Are we really up to the mark with our spiritual life with Lord Jesus Christ? If God says today, okay, I'm going to give you, grade you. Do you think we will be up to his expectations? No. None of us. Okay. Are we his children? Yes. 
Does he have expectations from us? Yes. Is he providing for us? Yes. You know, we are in this journey, we are taking one step after another. There's somebody who is struggling with some kind of a habit. Believer. Okay, what do you do? You help him overcome. He must overcome. You, don't, you become a saint in the view of God overnight as soon as you ask him to forgive. But in the journey of maturity, of growing spiritually, it is step by step and step by step. So therefore, there will be conflict. There will be a failure. In spiritual life, we will fail. We will fail. We definitely will fall. But it doesn't stop there. In Jeremiah it is written, if a man falls, will he not rise again? Yes, he will rise again. If a child falls, is, it not, is the child, name, child not able to uh, get up? If not, at least, at least the parent will help the child get up. If a man falls, will he not rise again? He will definitely rise again. In our spiritual life also, we may fall, but we will rise again. We will get victory. And not only that, the people of Israel, God was saying, you know what? You've been struggling for so many years, you didn't have rest. Hey, 430 years you didn't have rest, man. You don't know what is taking off. God says, now when you come to Canaan, I'll give you rest. There's a beautiful statement that says, Then the land had rest from the war. Then the land had rest from the war. Shall I tell you something? All the progress, all the growth that happened in the Bible, even the construction of the temple, it was only when there was peace. Why was Solomon able to build the temple? Okay, show me one thing. Did Solomon go for a war? Solomon had peace during his lifetime. And because he had peace during his lifetime, he was able to build the temple. It is during peace time that you can build the temple. So what is God saying to uh, Joshua and the people? I will give you rest. Not only that. You know, I will give you possessions. I will give you inheritance. This land is not yours. But now I'm going to give this land to you. So in possessing the land, we're talking about that topic now. Possessing the land, getting the land for your permanent inheritance. There are a few groups of people we're going to see. One group. Even before they came into the promised land, they saw the material. And they said, they saw the land, says they saw the pasture, they saw the grass, they saw their cattle, calculated, and then said, we want to stay back here. What was Moses' response? Numbers chapter 32. Moses was very angry. <coughs> He said, hey, did God take you out of that land of Egypt for you to stop here? That land belonged to two, two kings. They had killed those kings. In Numbers chapter 21, you find that. The king of Amorites, the king of Og, and the king called Og and king of Bashan, these were the two kings. That was not in the original plan. Think about this. That was not in the original plan. But these people wanted to see and calculate using their brain and they said, we want to stay back here. And he said, what you're doing is not right. God is promising you, God wants to take you to a land of Canaan. That's what he promised. But why do you want to stay back here? Oh, because we have a lot of pasture. Sometimes, you know, we do that. We do that. God wants us to give us the best place. What we do is, we want, we say, mm, I really don't want that. I'm okay with this. How many of our children do that? Or do our children do that? Yeah? Especially, you know, when mom cooks some food or you want them to taste something new. Yeah? They, they taste something and they like it and they stop there. You tell them, hey, you need to try that and then you can say no. They say, no, 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 no I don't like it. Hey, did you even try that? No. They didn't even see the promised land. You get the point? They didn't even see the promised land, but they saw whatever was available. That is spiritual immaturity. 
you see the surroundings you calculate and then you connect the dots and think this is the best for me now I want you to understand what you think is best for you is not what God thinks is best for you Do you get that what God see no parent wants a child to be underprivileged am I right if you are earning say hundred dollars a month you want your child to earn thousand dollars a month. Okay, is there any parent here or anybody anywhere in the world who starts feeling jealous and says, my son is earning say 500, I'm earning only 100, this fellow. You know, you don't care for that. You take that as a privilege. Is there any mother in the world who will feel jealous about her daughter being more beautiful than her? Can you show me anybody? Any mother Jealous of her daughter who has become Miss World, Miss uh, uh, USA, Miss Universe. Any mother thinks? No. Two, two months ago, there was a brother who came and gave a testimony here, Brother David. Remember that? Yeah, from New Jersey. That girl who played uh, the piano here. He was, she was sitting here. You know what she is? She's a Miss Teen USA. Uh, Miss Teen New Jersey. She is going to uh, compete in Miss USA contest. She was here at you know, our church right where, um, where, where I sit and play. She was playing my keyboard. And uh, father sang a song and that girl. So ask the mom. Ask Merlin. Merlin, are you jealous that your daughter is going to become uh, probably Miss USA? Are you kidding me? She is my daughter. You know what? You don't, you don't have the color that your daughter has. It's okay. She is my daughter. That is how a parent will think about. Whether it is your salary, whether it is your ability, whether it is your beauty. Father thinks, a mother thinks, you know, I want something better for my son and daughter. How much more spiritual father? In Matthew chapter 7 he says, you know, you are wicked people. You are evil people. You fathers and mothers, you are evil. But even though you are evil, you want the best for your children. How much more God? How much more me? And the Lord says, I want you to get the best. What we do is, we don't want that best. We just want to just pick up. I remember an example. One friend of mine told me this. You know, when somebody wants to give you a Mercedes car as a gift. Great, right? Mercedes cars. Amazing. Yeah, wonderful cars. Huh? Very safe cars. One, I mean, great cars. So, somebody wants to give you the Mercedes cars and they say, I want to give you this gift. Take this Mercedes car. You know? Uh, then you say, can I get that old tire in that garage also? Hey, are you kidding me? I am giving you a Mercedes car. Where is your eyes? Your eyes is on the what? The old, worn out, used tire. That is how we live. <coughs> we create our own underprivileged situation. God says, I am going to give you the land flowing with milk and honey. We say, no, no, I don't want the land flowing with milk and honey. This green grass is enough. Think about this. This green grass is enough because that is my need. That is where my cows and my, you know, my uh, uh, flock can eat the grass and live. Really? I'm going to show three people, three types of people in the category. There are several, but we don't have time for all of them. Three types of people. One person, one type of people. This extreme is what they don't want to even go according to the plan of God. They start in the journey, but they say, "This is better for me. I can. I am good enough here. I am good enough here." Let's talk about the second category. Joshua chapter eighteen. Joshua chapter eighteen. There is another category of people here. What are they doing? Verse 2, Joshua chapter 18 and verse 2, verse, uh, yeah, let's read from verse 1. The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. You know, Shiloh is an important place. Shiloh is the place where the tent of meeting was put. Uh, you know, the tent of meeting was always traveling with them in the desert, but now they found one permanent spot. The country was brought under their control, but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their 
inheritance. What does it mean? They came to Canaan. They're not claiming their inheritance. Hey, why do you think God redeemed you from Israel? What is the promise? What is the promise? Exodus 3, 7, to give you the land flowing with milk and honey, where there are all these people. You need to go what? Throw them out, get that land. God brought you, helped you cross through Red Sea, helped you cross through, you know, the river of uh, Jordan. And now, you just need to go, defeat those people. And of course, even in the defeating also, you cannot do it on your own. God did miracles. Jericho, how did Jericho fall? They just obeyed God, there was huge walls, they went around the walls and what happened? The walls crumbled and it was only Rachel, uh, Rahab who was saved from that entire Rahab and people in her house. That is all. Everybody else was destroyed. How did Jericho fall? God helped them. Every time they went for the battle, it was God who helped them. See, he brings you up to this point and he also wants you to uh, gain victory over the enemy. What are they doing? They came here, they're just sitting like this. So one day Joshua came and said, Hey, why are you not uh, taking your promised land? You're already in promised land. See, those fellows, they didn't want to come here. They wanted to stay back there. Let me tell you the, other, the rest of that part and then come in, uh, because I don't want you to go, go uh, I'm confused. So when Moses, they came to Moses and said, We want to stay back here. Moses said, What you're doing is not right. You are, going, you are becoming selfish. You want to stay back here and then let your brothers go and fight the battles on their own? This is not going to happen. So they came up and said, excuse me Moses, we have one uh, proposal. What is that? Um, let our wives and children our, and our cattle all stay here. We, all the men, we will cross the river Jordan and we'll come on to the other side, fight for all the rest of our brothers and after they are all settled down, then we will go back to our families. You get the point? And Moses said, mm, in that case, that's okay. In that, in that case, that's all right. So that's when the other people also came and fought for the rest of the tribes. So two and a half tribes took the portion on the uh, uh, east side, that is east of Jordan. That is Reubenites, Gadites, and half tribe of Manasseh. And then the rest of nine and a half tribes were on this side. The rest of nine and a half tribes. Out of these nine and a half tribes, two and a half tribes also took their portion. But the Bible says in Joshua chapter 18 verse 2, verse 3, uh, verse 2 it says, There were seven other Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. Really? You are already brought into the promised land. Go occupy and enjoy your property. There are some people who even after coming into the best place that God has planned, they have questions. Some people probably are lazy. You see, it could also be laziness. Do you think God likes laziness? Shall I tell you something? God doesn't like laziness. To the Thessalonians, Paul writes this. And he said, what, you know what he says? If you don't work, you cannot eat. Let me show you that. You may say, I'm, I'm making it up. Let me show you what the Bible says. Okay, Come with me to um, Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Yeah, for even when uh, we are with you. We gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. What is it? If you don't work, you cannot eat. Where is it written? In the Bible. But shall I tell you something? The Russians adopted this. They adopted this principle from the Bible. And that's why they said all the women also should start working. Go to Japan and see. Men, women, everyone works. There are people who don't even believe in the word of God. They picked up this principle and they employed. And how much we, how much
much more should we believe and uh, do this? Seven tribes. They didn't yet take their inheritance. So, you know what? It's like the people in book of Haggai. Turn with me to book of Haggai. You find this after Zephaniah. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament from behind the third book, Haggai chapter 1. And Haggai is a, a book that uh, is studied to understand uh, that this is after the 70 years of captivity of Babylonians. After they came from the Babylonian captivity, that's when Haggai uh, is writing these words. Uh, look at uh, verse 2, chapter 1 and verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. They say, no, 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 no there is so much of time. Okay, let's, let me tell you the background behind this. You know, after 70 years of the captivity because of by Nebuchadnezzar, God changed the kingdom and the Babylonian kingdom was taken over by the Medo-Persians. And the Medo-Persians, there was one king by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus says, God has told me that you should go and build your temple. God has appointed me to tell you that there you will build the temple. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Same thing that you find in the book of uh, uh, Ezra. Ezra says this, it's like chapter 1 and verse 2. This Ezra chapter 1 and verse 2. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heavens has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. So the king says, you can go and build a temple. What are the people saying? It's not time yet. It's not time yet. Everything that you need in life is given to you. Yeah, I want to go back to the theme of VBS. What is that? Um, you find this in Timothy, right? You find this in Timothy. I want you to look at that. It's a beautiful verse. Um, it says, uh, He has given everything that we need for our life on this earth and our godly life, right? He has given everything that we need in our life for godliness, he says, right? So, when God says, I have, I, every, I have everything for you, I, you, whatever you need in your physical life and in your spiritual life, I have everything that you need, I'm giving you, and what do we do? We think, you know, it is not time yet. It is not time yet. That is what we think of. What do these people do? They come to the promised land, but they still did not occupy that place. They did not occupy that place. So that's the second category of people. One category of people, they don't even get into that. They, want, they think they have the best for themselves. Second category of people, they come into the best place, but they don't enjoy that place. I always tell this example, and um, I think this is a um, this is a very good example for us to uh, learn this. And I, I always tell this, you know, uh, we went to um, we went to uh, Dallas to attend some special meetings, and in the uh, special meetings after the uh, you know uh, we, we I think five boys we went to a place and then. We, we rented a suite in Best Western uh, Hotel in da Dallas. So next morning we had to go for the meeting. So the previous night we came. So we all just uh, ate outside and then we went and uh, slept in the rooms. So two boys had, in the morning they came and they, they were so complaining. They were so complaining. It's, uh, they used to call me sir. They were all my students. So they said, sir. It was so cold. We are so mad. You know, this this guy was this guy didn't give us the uh, comforters, and uh, we couldn't even go there. And we were so mad the whole night. We were shivering. Then 
they came into our room and they saw me and the other uh, no we two people on you know on the big bed and then we had our covers he said this is unfair you fellows had the covers you had the comforters and then he didn't give it to us he said okay let's see what happened so i went to their bedroom and i said hey how can you say they didn't give you the comforters and all that uh, you know blankets i open i pulled from the bed under the pillow and I pulled it and said this is where it is you know what they said oh you know what we were sleeping on the comforters the whole night they have everything but where are they they are under you so what is what, what is your situation you are shivering and struggling the whole night tell me how many of us do that these people are like that they came to the best place they say maybe it's not time yet or oh, we don't believe we are really here i don't know if we will stay here or not i don't know those other people might be strong we may not be able to defeat them so whatever be the reason you know what they are not living a victorious life i want to share a third person in the bible turn with me to book of joshua book of joshua i want to share with you another person in this story i want you to see what he does chapter 14 chapter 14 and this man he came to joshua he said hey joshua i want to talk to you joshua said okay what is that so this man came to joshua and said these words um were said i was 40 years old when moses the servant of the lord sent me from kadesh barnea to explore the land and i brought him back a report according to my convictions but my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear i however followed the lord my god wholeheartedly the day the, uh, that day on that day moses swore to me the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the lord my god wholeheartedly Now then just as the Lord promised he has kept me alive for 40 years since the time he had said this to Moses since Israel moved about in the desert so here I am today 85 years old he was how many 45 years old now he is 85 right he was 40 years old now it's 85 okay he is now 85 see what he says verse 11 I am still as strong today as vigorous to go out to battle now I was then now give me this what country what is the word in your bible give me this hill country give me this hill country that the lord has promised me that day you yourself heard that the anakites you know what anakites they are huge gigantic fellows huge guys maybe 8 foot 9 foot guys very strong and these are the people who live there but the lord helping me i will drive them out just as he had said there is a third person in this story who is ready to take risk for the lord who is ready to go fight against those big giants when david fought against goliath you know see the height difference that guy is so huge and david is such a small boy who won david won why because he said who is this uncircumcised man who is blaspheming the name of the living god he is so defying the name of the god who is a living god and the army of the living god he is trying to insult them and i am going to come in the name of the lord he didn't come on his own what happened he took a you know slingshot stone sank into his temple he fell down david took goliath's sword and cut off his head and held it up what happened all the philistines they ran away the whole country got strength you know what god wants god wants risk takers he doesn't want compromisers 
See, the compromises won't be uh, uh, useful to God or anybody. Somebody said like this, isn't it? It's a dead fish which go with the flow. If it's a living fish, you know what it can do? It can go against the flow. If the fish is dead, wherever the water flows, the fish will go. There are a lot of compromises in the Christian world. Oh yeah, this is how, okay. Yeah, all right, Lord, you understand my situation. If Dave, Daniel was a compromiser, he would he would not have proved that God is a real God and a powerful God in the, in the, the den of the lions. You know why he was put in the den of the lions? Because he defied the orders. He said, "Okay, you ask me not to pray to God, and you want to test me? Hold on." I will definitely pray to my God. I don't care for the consequences. You know, if you really study the life of David, you know, when I study the life of Daniel, not David, Daniel, this is one thing I find. Every time he stood and took risk for the Lord, the Lord was honored. And the heathen king, he stood for Daniel's beliefs. How will the world know your beliefs? How will the world know that you stand strong for the Lord? You have to face a task. You have to face a hill in your life. Caleb said, give me that hill country. Don't give me a plane. Don't give me an easy task. Have you seen people who said, don't give me an easy task. Give me a tough task. I like challenges. I want to take that. And Caleb did that. He was 85 years old. Only two people who came to the promised land from that previous generation was Joshua and Caleb. He went and then they cleared up all the forest in that hill country, you know, and then because of that, that place was given to him. That place is called Kiryat Arba. Then later they changed the name to Hebron. Hebron was one of the six cities of refuge. It fell in whose lot? Caleb's lot. You see, I want, to, I want you to know one thing. Sometimes, you know, God put, gives us a test. And then when we take that one step, because of that one step, there are so many other perks that you get. You know, in February, we went to a conference at Lancaster. We registered for that. We paid, I think, $99 for the conference. But as soon as we went, they gave us a big goodie bag. They fed us. They put us in the hotel. They gave, I think, eight or nine books. Each person, each person gets that many books. If you really see the cost of all those books, it's more than $99. And not only that, you can participate for two days in that conference. That's where I met the uh, uh, pastor of uh, Sherwood Baptist Church. You know who's Sherwood Baptist Church? Uh, the movies, what is that? Uh, Facing the Giants. Uh, then uh, Courageous, yeah, uh, there's one more, right? Fireproof. Fireproof, you remember that movies? The pastor, the pastor Michael Catt. If you see the Courageous movie, in that movie Courageous, the first scene is where there is a father who's trying to save his daughter from uh, people who are uh, uh, taking his car away from the gas station. It's Pastor Bell. It's Pastor Mel. And we sat next to one another the rain. And I said, man, you, you are awesome. He said, actually, I'm a pastor, man. So the whole church were actors. They were, the, the director was from the same church. I could meet all those people. Michael Catt is a great blessing in my life. Michael Catt sat in the same place. Years later, I sat in the same church, in the same seat, in the same office. I could meet this man later. What, with what? $99. Do you think $99 we spend elsewhere, you will be able to get that? Something, sometimes it's like this. God says, you know, you have a task, you have to take a risk. Once you do this, you know what will happen? I will take you much beyond this. I want you to look at this. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations 
forever and ever. Amen. How much does God do for us? How much does He do? He does more than we ask or imagine. He does more than we ask or imagine. The VBS theme that we were talking about, what does it say? So everything that we need for life and godliness, God has provided for us. 2 Peter 1.3 says, God has provided everything for us that we need in our life. He has blessed us in spiritual places. He has provided everything that we need. What do we need to do? Capture it. Receive it. Enjoy it. There are three types of people. Before we take part in the table, I want to ask you this question. Are any of us like the people who say, Lord, I don't care for your best, I know what is my best. And we stay outside the promised land. We stay in Gilead. That is a place called Gilead. But in the grace of God, He also gave them cities of refuge even thus there, that place also. He didn't abandon them. He gave them cities of refuge even in Gilead. But we don't go by what God wants us to be. Second category. God has blessed us in everything. We are just sitting like idle people, not receiving it. The third kind of person is Caleb, who says, you know what, hey, give me the tough portion. I want to fight. I want to fight the greatest battle. And that's where in Joshua chapter 14, last verse is, then the land had rest from the war. Then the land had rest from the war. When? When Joshua, when Caleb took on the most difficult place and said, see, number one, this is a hill country. Number two, the people who are living are very big giants. But you know what? Caleb says, hey, when we came from, when he came to Canaan, this is not the first time I'm seeing this. I came, I was one of the team, one of the members in the team. I came as a spy. When he came as a spy and we gave a report to Moses, you know what the other people said? You know what the other people said? What is the report they said? We look like what? Caterpillars to them. He says, we look like locusts to them. We look, we look like worms to those people. We, they are so huge of people. And when they came back, they brought a big bunch of grapes where two people had to carry it in a pole from Eshkol. They see the proof. And they see God has helped them gain the victory all this time, but still they say, we can't do this. Caleb says, I've seen that. I know that day when people were saying, we look like grasshoppers to them. Not cattle, grasshoppers. We look like grasshoppers to them. That day I stood. Joshua, we both stood. And out of the 12 people, we were two of the only people who gave their report and said, yet, I know that these are the facts. They are very strong. It's a difficult place. It's not like Egypt. There are hills and valleys. It's okay. But you know what? The God who has brought us till now, thus far, will help us gain victory over this place also. Time came. came Caleb comes to Joshua and says, Joshua, Give me that hill country. I want that place. I want the most difficult spot. And what did Caleb do? He says, I'm strong like that day 45 years ago. I'm going to occupy that place. What is that one thing is defeating you? What is that one thing where you are failing all the time? Let's be that Caleb. And say, Lord, with your strength, I can win. Paul says in the Philippines, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whenever I listen to the story of David and Goliath, I get excited. A teenager defeated a trained military man, a huge giant, because he went in the name of the Lord. There's also one other side to that. We don't have time, but I'll just tell you one more thing. Study Joshua chapter 14. And you'll understand why Caleb was able to win against the hill country. You know, there are three times this one word comes. You know what is that? He followed and obeyed the Lord wholeheartedly. The reason for Caleb's success 
was that he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. That is where the secret of success is. May God help us as we take part in the table and say, Lord, I want to be that person like Caleb. In my life, I have situations and I want to overcome. I want to win over them. I don't want to be like the people who really don't want to get into the promised land, but just sit back and say, this is enough for me. Second category, coming into the promised land, you don't want to receive that. But I want to be like Caleb. I want to take on the toughest situation. Let's pray.